in Hindi, there's no word for thank you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no word for thank you in Hindi, right? No, in Hindi, there's no word for thank you, right? No, you said dhanyavad. Oh, dhanyavad. Well, that means I offer my respects to you. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a Hindi lesson. Because <laughs> the tradition is, if someone does something for you, that is their benefit. The person who serves another person is actually the person who's benefited. So, when you say thank you to someone, they think, what is this? <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work because you're saying thank you for doing something to me, but actually by serving, you're doing something for yourself. That's the whole Vedic culture is to serve is higher than being served. So when you get a chance to serve, that's the best. <laughs> So no need to say thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course now, yeah, we can fit it in there somewhere, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it it works when you work it around. Okay, so she might Bhagavatam. <clears throat> Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Gopitana Vallabha Giri Varadhanu Hiyahe Jai Gopitana Vallabha Giri Varadhanu Hiyahe Gopitana Sodanandana, Braja Janahan Janayad. Yes, Sodanandana, Braja Janahan Janayad. Jamulatira, Havan, Yahan. Jamuna Tira Hevan Yamuna Tira Hejayura Matava Kunjabiha Hejayura Matava Kunjabi Hari Hari Kunjabi Hari 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 Gary, Varadhari, Hadopita, 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 
यमुन तेरा है भाई प्यारी यमुन तेरा यमुन तेरा है भाई प्यारी यमुन तेरा है भाई प्यारी Kunjavi ha, Kunjavi ha, Jamuna Tira, Jamuna Tira, Jamuna Tira, Jamuna Tira, Jamuna Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Tiger, Krishna, Jaya Jaya Prabhu 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 Jaya Prabhu Jaya Jaya Prabhu 
प्रभु आनी प्रभु पाध्याय प्रभु पाध्याय प्रभु पाध्याय जय प्रभु कम और पेमेंट दे प्रभुपाद की जाए हरिनाम संकीर्तन की जाए श्रीमद् भागवतम की जाए ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So reading from Canto 8, Chapter 16, the Peyo Vrata process of worship, this is verse number 6. Apivati tayo bhyetya Kutumba saktaya tvaya Grihara pujita yata Pratyutenena vakvachit Apivata apivati tayo bhyetya Kutumba saktaya tvaya Grihara pujita yata Patyuta nena vat kvachet Apit patita yo bhyetya Kutumba saktaya tvaya Griha apujita yata Patyuta nena Weather, either, 
Aditya. Guests who come without an invitation. Abhyatya. <coughs> Coming to the home. Kutumba Asaktaya. Who were too attached to the me to the family members. Tuaya by you. Grihat from the house. A pujita, without being properly welcomed. Yata, went away. Pratyuta nena, by standing up. Va, either. Kachit, sometimes. <clears throat> So, Kashyapa Muni is speaking to his wife Aditi. What has happened is that the, the powerful uh, Daitya and also great personality as Bali Maharaj has taken over the heavenly planets and all the demigods were advised not to try to fight against him because he was too powerful. So they all left the resident and Bali took over the heavens. And now Aditi, who is the mother of the devas, she's lamenting the situation. And now Kishapa, who's her husband, is inquiring, what is the cause of your lamentation? So he's asking her different questions, why she feels the way she does. And then he says here, I wonder whether because of being too attached to the members of your family, you have failed to properly receive uninvited guests, who therefore went away, not welcomed, who therefore were not welcomed and went away. So he's asking, you're too attached to the family, uninvited guests came, you didn't welcome, and, that, and therefore they went away. Is that why you're lamenting? Purport. It is the duty of a householder to receive guests, even if a guest be an enemy. When a guest comes to your home, one should properly receive them by standing up and offering him a seat. It is enjoying griha satrum api praptam vishvatam akuto bayam. If even an enemy comes to one's home, one should receive him in such a way that the guest will forget that his host is an enemy. According to one's position, one should properly receive anyone who comes to one's home. At least a seat and a glass of water should be offered so that a guest will not be displeased. Kashapa Muni inquired from Aditi whether disrespect had been shown to guests or atitis. The word atiti refers to one who comes without an invitation. Omagyan timidandasya gina jina salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha. Nama om Vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine. Namaste saraswati deve gauravani tarine nirvise sa sunyavari pasyatya de satarine. Pancha kalpa dhruvischa kripa Patita nam bhavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shiva Siddhi Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so Vedic culture is the, the superior of all human cultures because it's a culture that is founded on spiritual principles. And therefore, both spiritual principles are the foundation for proper material activities. Just to do something because it's convenient or because I feel like it should be done this way or because someone has done it before and therefore I simply do it the way they done it, is really, really not culture, it's just whimsical. Therefore Vedic culture even teaches here something quite extreme. 
that even if your enemy comes, then you should not refuse that person to come into your home. Why? Because it is understood that in family life, the home is a place where you fulfill your duty as a grihasa to become Krishna conscious. It's not simply a place where you live and you, you uh, enjoy your senses centered around family activities. It is called grihasta. Grihasta means spiritual, a place of spiritual cultivation and not simply a home where you hide out and sleep, eat, and you know, invite the, your family members to do the same. <laughs> This is not a home. So Vedic culture actually teaches the principle of detachment in all aspects of life, even in family life. That the home is actually a place where you, where you practice Krishna consciousness. And welcoming guests is considered to be, there's a whole principle, there's a whole. I have a manual, it's about this thing, how to welcome guests. I mean, it's this thick, and it's been put together by devotees based on Shastric statements on receiving guests in temples and in other, you know, places where the devotees reside. So it's considered one of the highest forms of etiquette and must be properly executed. Otherwise, one becomes condemned if they don't. And see, Diti's lamenting. She's not feeling happy. And a Kashapa doesn't know why. So he mentions, oh, maybe you didn't receive guests in the proper way who were not invited. Why would he mention that? Because that is one of the most important aspects of living in the family, to welcome guests. In fact, it's mentioned that the Grihasta should always have extra food ready and any time anyone comes, they can get food immediately, or at least Prabhupada says here, a glass of water and a place to sit. <laughs> There's a beautiful story. It's not so beautiful, but actually it's very beautiful in its message in the life of Ramanujacharya. In that particular pastime, Ramanujacharya was traveling to different places in his uh, area and uh, he came across one place where he had a very rich disciple. And um, he told his brahmacharis, uh, I want to go to his house tonight and uh, stay there and ha tell him Guru Maharaj is coming later today and uh, have prasadam prepared. Okay, so um, two brahmacharis who were his assistants, they went to the house of this, I can't remember his name, but his name has been mentioned. They came, they knocked on the door, he opened the door and he saw, oh, my god brothers, because he was initiated by Ramanujacharya, oh, you've come, please come in. So he, they came in, why have you come? Well, Guru Maharaj is in town and he wants to come to your house this evening for prasadam, so make all arrangements. So, he became really excited and he started calling his servants, you know, bring this, do this, buy this, make sure this, clean this place. And he became like really animated to make sure everything was nice. But what happened was, he neglected to honor the guests who came as messengers. He didn't give them a seat, he didn't offer them a glass of water, he didn't even talk to them after he heard that his Guru Maharaj was coming. He simply was making preparations. So they saw, oh, he's so excited. So they just turned around and they left. And he went back to Ramanujachari. And he asked, did you go? Oh, yes. Uh, did you tell him? Yes. Oh, he was very excited. And then Ramanujacharya, because he's Sri Kalagyan, he understands. He said, how did he treat you? Well, well he, he let us in the house, but, and, but when he heard that you were coming, he simply turned all his attention to making the arrangements for, your, for welcoming you tonight. 
Did he give you anything? No. Glass of water, place to sit, nothing. I'm not going. Brahmadujachar said, I'm not going. Then he said to the same brahmacharis, I have another disciple who lives in this town. He's very, very poor. And he goes out every day to beg just enough food so he maintains his family. So you go and you tell him, Guru Maharaj is coming tonight. Hmm. So, of course, when they went, he wasn't home, but his wife was there. And when they knocked on the door, she looked out. She didn't come out because they were so poor, she didn't even have proper dress. So she didn't, she was very chaste. She didn't come out to welcome them, Brahmachari. She wasn't dressed properly. They didn't even, she didn't even have enough clothes. So she said, oh, and she talked through the door, yes. Oh, Guru Maharaj is coming tonight, and he wants you to arrange prasadam for him. Uh oh. And then she was thinking, my God, we don't have anything. <laughs> we don't even have enough food to eat from day to day. How are we going to honor Guru Maharaj? But then she thought, well, here comes some gas. I have to do something. So she ran into the house, and she found some water. And that's all she had. And she gave the two brahmacharis some water, and she welcomed them really nicely. They felt really welcomed. And then uh, she's think they went away after giving the message, and she's thinking, what am I going to do? Guru Maharaj is coming. So she was thinking, I have to serve my spiritual master. But then she remembered there was one grocer that was living nearby. He had a grocery store. And he was always chasing after her. But she was never interested in him. She was quite attractive, but she had nothing. So when she would go there to spend whatever few rupees she had for whatever she needed, he would always try to entice her for, you know, loving relationships, Hare Krishna. <laughs> so... He, she thought, well, here's a chance to get some food from my Guru Maharaj. So she went to the grocer and she said, um, my, Guru Maharaj, my Guru Maharaj is coming tonight. Please give me, and she gave, had a whole list of things. And if you give me all of these things, I'll satisfy your desire. She was willing to do that just to serve her spiritual master. So the grocer thought, ha, ah, she's finally surrendered. You know, so he's all excited, you know. <laughs> so uh, she gets you know, dal, rice, and atta, so many nice vegetables, everything and more for a nice feast. So she goes back home. She has everything. And it takes her many hours because she doesn't have much cooking facility. And she cooks this grand feast. Now it's in the evening time. Her husband comes home. And she, he's asking, what is all this? Well, Guru Maharaj is coming tonight, and he sent his brahmacharis, and then she kind of hung her head, feeling embarrassed. Jai Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. And... Uh, so he said, how did you get all this? We don't have any money. I just begged a little bit of rice today for us tonight. She said then she was embarrassed. And then she finally told the story, what happened. And he was, he was thinking, wow, what a wonderful wife I have. She's willing to sacrifice just for, to serve our spiritual master very nicely. So she, he said, yeah, you can, you can go to him. And then, finally, it was the evening time, and Ramanuja arrives with his brahmacharis, and she has this grand feast she cooked. Took her hours, beautiful feast, nice vegetables, and so many wonderful things. Uh, it's not described what she cooked, but it was really big. <laughs> and then 
Ramanujacharya, he's, he's questioning, but he doesn't say anything. He's thinking, how does she get all this? But he's quiet about that. And finally, he sits down and he honors the prasadam. And then he asks, you know, I know you're all very poor. And uh, so how is it you were able to get this? And then she couldn't speak. She was too embarrassed. And then the husband told the whole story. So Ramanujachari said, all right, but you go to him tonight, but here, take some of these remnants, because after he left, he took his prashadam, he left remnants. She wrapped the remnants in a package, and she, she he said, bring her to the grocer when you go to him. So she did. She wrapped it all up. Now she's going to meet the grocer, and he's thinking, ha ha, she's coming. He's all excited, you know. He, he's, he's dancing in ecstasy. <laughs> he's, he's doing new dance steps that he never did before. <laughs> he's so happy. And, you know, he's, she comes, <laughs> and she comes in, and uh, she says, and he's so happy to see her. And then he, she said, Guru Maharaj is so happy. You served him so nice by giving all these nice groceries. He wanted to give you some of the remnants of his prashadam f to thank you for it. And she, he said, oh, that's wonderful. So she opens it up. He starts eating. And while he's eating, something happens. <laughs> he starts crying. His heart changes. His, his mind is completely changed. And he starts crying. And he starts, thinking, he starts speaking to her, Oh, I am such an evil person. You are such a chaste lady. Uh, I am so, I'm so unhappy that I had been chasing after you. Your Guru Maharaj is so wonderful. Please, here, take some more. He wanted to give her more groceries. She complete, he, he completely changed. His mind and his heart completely changed. He lost all of his enthusiasm for having enjoying her at all, and he gave her more groceries. The power of Guru Prashad, eh? that's really powerful. It says there is there is called Maha. Now Maha is powerful, but there's another substance that is so powerful that it's even higher than Maha. That's called Maha Maha. And I mentioned the nectar devotion. There are three powerful substances. The dust from the lotus feet of the pure devotee. The water that washes the feet of the pure devotee. And the remnants of maha prasadam taken by the pure devotee. These three substances are so powerful that it says in the scriptures you should do anything to get it. And so some devotees took that quite literally <laughs> in the old days. So they would steal Srila Prabhupada's plate and run into the back room and you know hide it from the rest of the devotees <laughs> and eat it all themselves. <laughs> maha, maha. So that's mentioned. Yeah, Nectar Devotion speaks about that. And this is very powerful. And you can imagine Ramanujacharya, he, he's, uh, Ramanuja means younger brother of Ram. He is an energy of Lakshman who has manifested himself in this world as Ramanujacharya. He's not just a small personality or a great personality. He's actually an energy of Lakshman, Lakshman, the brother of Sri Ram, who came to the world to preach Krishna consciousness. So his remnants completely changed that grocer's mind and heart into, you know, he was just like a puppy dog. <laughs> it changed completely. Now, this other rich person who was, he made all these arrangements for his Guru Maharaj, and Ramanujacharya never came. Finally, he actually went to find Ramadhyu and later, and, and he, 
he, and he fell at the feet of his spiritual master and he was like really in anxiety. Uh, did I commit some offense? I had prepared such a nice, uh, you, were you said you were becoming to my home and I was so happy to serve you, but you never came. What happened? Well, he failed to serve my assistants. You didn't welcome them. Therefore, I didn't see any need to come to your place. So, if you serve the spiritual master, that's nice. And that's both most to be important. But if you serve the devotees, that's even higher. <laughs> that's even higher because das, das, anudas. Gopi bhatar padekamalayor. Das, das, anudas. The more you serve, those who are serving the Lord, the more you actually serve both those devotees and the Lord himself, and that's the highest. So Prabhupada would say, das, das, anudas, a hundred times removed. The more you can serve down the line, just like we have the example of um, when Lord Chaitanya was in... Um, and uh, the house of, uh, of um, Srivas Thakur, it was the Mahaprakash Leela, 21 hours that the Lord received the worship in the mood of the Supreme Personality of God. And Mahaprabhu never does that. He's always in the mood of a devotee of the Lord. Now he's accepting worship. And so there was a grand Abhishek festival going on and they were bathing the Lord. And all of the more elevated personalities were right there taking the ba the buckets, of, actually clay pots of water, and pouring on it. Advaita, Srivas, and uh, Nityananda, they were all bathing to Lord, and some of the more intimate. And there was a long line of devotees all the way from the Ganges to where Lord Chaitanya was in the house of Srivas. And... The ones, they were standing in the Ganges, filling the pots and passing it to the next person, who would pass it to the next person. They made a line and then would come all the way up to Lord Chaitanya, and that's how they bathed him. So Lord Chaitanya, after the bathing, he looks and he sees this one elderly lady, and she's standing in the Ganges, and he turns to Srivas, he says, who's that? And uh, Lord Chaitanya said, that's Duki. Now, dukkhi means miserable <laughs> or unhappy. It's, that's the actual. So, Lord Chaitanya said, Dukkhi? We give her a new name. Her new name is Suki, <laughs> which means happy. <laughs> the Lord Chaitanya blessed her. Why? Because he saw that she, she wasn't really looking for any recognition. All she wanted to do was to serve to devotees, that's all. And she was serving in such a, what we say, insignificant way, being all the way in the back, not looking for any recognition, just being there to serve. But the Lord noticed it, and he said, you know, she's the best, because she just wants to serve, that's all. And she wants to serve to please. So that's the highest. So here, we go back to our, you know, the situation that's being here, that the home is a place that we that you serve. It's not a place to enjoy. It's a place to develop Krishna consciousness to invite guests to your home. And even if an enemy comes, as we see from this particular verse, he's called Atita. There is Tita, the Titi, Atiti. Atiti means an unwelcome guest. Have you ever had that experience? I have. I was traveling and preaching, and so we were looking up the different uh, Indian houses in the area we were traveling, just to see who's an Indian and where maybe we could go out there in their house and get some prashadam. And this was in America now, <laughs> not in India. And so we were going, and uh, I, I just saw one name in a phone book. I told the devotee who was with me, call him up and. 
tell him I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> so he called him up and he said, and I asked my assistant what happened. He said, well, he's busy tonight. He can't, he, you can't come. <laughs> so I thought, ah, TT, you know. <laughs> so he, I never met the man. But we did have some luck with other people and finally we did get a place to stay. <laughs> So, yeah, um, that's just the way it is in Western countries. But in India, Prabhupada said, if you're walking across someone's property and in, uh, in the Western world, they come out with a gun and say, or they, you know, they scare you away by shooting the gun in the air and say, get out of our property, you know. <laughs> Who are you if you're walking on my lawn? <laughs> uh, but in India, if you do that, they say, oh, saintly persons are walking on my property. My property is getting blessed. They come out and they offer flower garlands and maybe some incense and they do some puja to you and ask you if you would like to come in and offer and take a little bit prashadam. He said, that's Vedic culture. <laughs> An uninvited guest is considered to be, and this is scripture, a representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, that's how uninvited guests are seen. So, you know, this is, a, this, is a, this is called human culture, real culture. So that's why it's being mentioned here. Uh, Diti is lamenting, she's not lamenting for that, but Kashyap is making this point that as a grihasta, if someone uninvited comes, even if it's your enemy, you know, you, you welcome them so nice that they forget that actually they're the enemy and you're their enemy. And as a way of honoring them too, when Srila Prabhupada was sitting with George Harrison in London, they were talking together and Prabhupada said, bring some prasadam for George, bring some sweets. So they came in and they brought in three sweets and gave it to George. Prabhupada said, no. Three means enemy. So if you offer someone three of an item of food, that means you're saying to that person, you are my enemy. So you can't offer three. Three is for enemy. Two or four is proper. That's Vedic culture. Of course, for the deities, that's different. You do that. But for a guest comes, if you offer three, of course, people don't even know about that, so they don't say anything. But those who know Vedic culture mean, means three means, oh, I'm your enemy, okay. <laughs> You're giving that sign. So every, the culture is so finely, can, finely you know, arranged that all aspects of interpersonal relationships or have certain innuendos or moods which indicate a particular type. Just like in Western countries, if sometimes you walk along the true street and you see somebody and you say, hello, right? That's nice, right? Hello, but well, what does hello mean? It means, oh hell, you know? <laughs> oh hell, there you are again. <laughs> it doesn't have any, you know, culture to it. But if you say namaste, <laughs> that means I offer my respects to you. Yeah, so just like if you go on, if you go, if you travel in India and you go on to the plains, the hostess, when you're going on the plane, they always say namaste, like that. Of course, now it's becoming more westernized, but that's the culture. Namaste means, you know, namaste means I honor that, I honor that soul which is sitting within your heart, which is the Supreme Lord, actually. Now this is actually culture here. So we get a little indication of a little bit about Vedic culture from these series of verses here. And then Kashyap will go on and talk about what happens to people who don't follow the Vedic culture and how they are condemned. We, used to, we saw the example of Ramanujacharya. Because he didn't, he didn't even show any indication of wanting to do anything for his messengers who came to talk about him. You know, the Lord Ramanujacharya didn't even go to his house like that. 
So a guest is very, very important like that. So one of the things that when our temple, when people come in here, like for the first time, like for a Sunday feast, sometimes we get some new people. We should always search out and see who's new and come up to them and say, oh, thank you for coming. How did you hear about us? Make them feel comfortable, maybe even talk to them a little bit and tell them about the... In other words, welcoming a guest is actually Krishna conscious philosophy and seva. And it's very important we do that. In some temples, what we do is that when after, during the Sunday feast, we ask, is there anybody here for the first time? And then some people raise their hand. We say, oh, thank you for coming. And there is a gift for you before you leave. Please see this devotee. And one devotee raises his hand. He'll give you a gift. Make sure you get your gift. And also, please leave your name and address and contact information with us. And then we'll keep you on our mailing list and we'll invite you, give you information of our festivals. That way you can come. So this is one of the ways to really preach to new people. Because the first impression is the most powerful impression. Because <laughs> if people come in and they're neglected and nobody talks to them and they just look around and they say, hmm, yeah, nice people, but there's other places to go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important. Welcoming guests is just, it's actually the highest thing you can do. Yeah. It's actually, you know, they say it's even, you're welcoming a guest means you're welcoming the Supreme Personality of Godhead who has appeared as a guest. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they say that. So, yeah, just to give a little indication, that, that could be adopted here. I have a, someone who is called a guest master. The one devotee who has that service. And when guests come, of course, you have your reception. And then when they come through there, they should get a nice invitation and talk, you know, give them a little gift and welcome them, invite them to come into the temple, take part in the activities. It's nice if somebody always stays with them for the for, for their and then that's preaching. <laughs> that's preaching because people in the material world they find that they're looking for, they're not looking so much for spirituality, they're looking for relationships. They're looking for a group of people that they can really be with and start to, you know, learn about and, and kind of like and find out more about life. It's about, it's about sadhu sangha, it's about association. That's usually the main reason why people come, to try to find, you know, some people that they can maybe practice some spirituality, but it's the people that make the difference. The, the tradition, what the, our philosophy, that comes later. They don't know about that, but as soon as we make them feel welcomed in a very wonderful way, then they, they tell their friends, <laughs> and then they come back <laughs> like that. Okay, so any questions or comments? Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, would uh, any guru nowadays uh, be satisfied if uh, his disciple uh, do the same, like uh, for this story from Jacharya? <coughs> and Mataji, I mean, with the same attitude and so on. Okay. That is what I'm wondering. I, How to understand that point, actually? Yeah. Can you repeat that question? Because somehow I missed a few of the words. Uh, Mataji had attitude to satisfied uh, this person because of a satisfying guru. Yeah. So how how would you think nowadays guru if Mataji do the same? Well, I don't think anybody's that poor. <laughs> 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 so I don't think you'll have that problem. <laughs> No, everybody has something <laughs> nowadays, you know. 
And you're never going to find people. That's, that's only in the remote villages where people are, you know, uh, maybe for whatever reason. Uh, in the Western countries, you don't find... Well, of course, you have homeless people in some countries. And there's people who have... So because there's no home, nobody goes there anyway. <laughs> so they're homeless. <laughs> I don't think you'll have to worry about that. <laughs> well, you think we should incorporate that into our, our much Mataji ashram? You know, no. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> There's always you can always find food somewhere in Western countries. Food's everywhere, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> yes, Urugai. <clears throat> Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, in the in the story, uh, there is this Vedic uh, culture uh, uh, advisor suggests this. Uh, 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 oh, I got, a better answer was welcoming. You could wait. Let me get I'm back sorry. to his answer. Yeah. I just thought of the the better. <laughs> Just tell the lady to go to the Hare Krishna temple and get some food, and then, then that's perfect. Because yeah. you can always come here and get food, right? So, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, we always give food, so anybody who wants food, they can come here. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, in, in, in the story you were uh, uh, mentioning, uh, uh, this um, uh, Ramanuja Acharya is, is dissatisfied with, with rich devotee not receiving uh, this not so uh, politically significant guests, I mean his right. representatives. Just brahmacharis, they just... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but isn't, isn't this a bit uh, duplicious on the part of Vedic culture? Because there are also big wealth differences. And shouldn't Ramanuja Acharya also demand that, that rich devotee uh, do something for a poor devotee so that lady would not get into such a situation to, to be forced to, to offer herself for, for food, uh, basically. Isn't this strange? Shouldn't be Vedic culture also... also uh, well, he didn't know about it. Uh -huh. He didn't know about it. She just did it on her own. She was thinking, she didn't even tell her husband. She went ahead and did it even before telling her husband. Nobody knew except she. She was just thinking, Guru Maharaj is coming, what am I going to do? I have nothing to offer him. That would be the worst. I mean, she could have waited till her husband come home and then told, but she didn't. She just wanted to get the get the get the prasadam ready for her. Yeah. Uh, uh, so nobody knew about it. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that specific case. But but generally, I'm asking: isn't also isn't our responsibility if devotees rich to do something to relieve? Economic suffering of less fortunate one. How much devotees. money do you need? Do you need some money? <laughs> are you asking now? Are you begging? Uh, are you are you offering? Which one? What yeah, side? Yeah. What side are you on? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. <laughs> if you're begging, then well, we can help you. No question about it. We'll take up a collection for you. But but but, but, but uh, is is there a place for wealth redistribution in 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 Vedic culture? Yeah 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 sure, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be institutionalized. <laughs> it's not a matter of institutionalizing it. Yeah, devotees help devotees. <clears throat> Sometimes devotees come and say, "I need some money," and we send them money. I know one devotee. He's he's helping his god brothers. A lot. He sends them large donations of money so they can maintain their life. There's, <clears throat> yeah, it happens all the time. But we don't advertise that. <clears throat> yeah, there was one devotee 
he uh, needed, he was going to get kicked out of his country because he didn't have enough money to maintain. So he, he came to me and I arranged for him to get money. So, yeah, we do that. But if they don't ask, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. But just like in the in uh, in India in Chalpati in in Radhagopinath Temple, nobody has that problem because they have a whole system. That anybody needs anything, whatever it is, there is a way to receive it through the system. If they need a job, they they get help finding a job. Or not only finding one, they get a job. If they need, if they get sick and they need money to, for paying medical bills, they'll take, they'll they'll give money for that. So no, a devotee should not be put into a situation where he he's stuck or she's stuck materially, and there's nobody to help. Devotees always devotees helping devotees is Krishna conscious society. Yeah, whatever you need. It's not just about, you know, chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> it's helping on all levels. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that's natural, that's human. Even people, you know, who come just like in India, people stop, you see beggars all the time, and people come up and beg you. We, you can't refuse a beggar. You have to give them something, something. Even if it's just a little bit of a prashad, like we carry in India, again, Radha Gopinath Temple, all of the drivers who drive around, they're, they're required to carry prashadam with them. And if someone comes and there's no prashadam, then they have to give them some coins or some, some donation. Bhakti Siddhanta chastises his Grihasta disciples for refusing beggars. He said, if you do that, you'll become hard-hearted. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like that. That's Vedic culture. Yeah. Uh, now, as you speak, uh, because we devotees have sometimes this mentality <laughs> That, that our donations will spoil beggars, that we use it for whatever, for alcohol. Well, then, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's also there. Therefore, if you see that this is what's going to happen, you give prashadam. <clears throat> yeah. And some, yeah, I've been, I've been traveling, and I, once, you know, once in a while I see these persons, and you give them a little prashadam, and I say, oh, thank you, God bless you. Yeah, it happens a lot. I even say that, oh, Thank you. God bless you. They always say that. We give little food. And sometimes you see when you give a little food, they look at it and think, I wanted money instead. <laughs> but they take it anyway. So, but yeah, don't give money. Give food. But still we should give fair price. Uh, uh our Guru Maharaj once got angry with devotees because they were they were bargainingly so determinedly in, in in India for for some items, and he said to the devotees, you know, you should give some money, some fair price to yeah. the people. The people did it, so yeah. whatever they will, you know, that's using that money is their problem. You should give something for for what you are buying. You know? Yeah. That. Yeah. That's that's good. And yeah, he was one hundred percent right for speaking like that. Yeah. I mean, we we walk out of Mayapur, and then there's the there is the uh, you know rickshaw wallas are out there. So they want they ask you know we want to go to Jagannath Temple. How much? Three hundred rupees. Three hundred. <laughs> I'll give you. 100. No, no, 300. I'll give you 100. All right, 200. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, they'll always ask for a lot more. So, in a very friendly way, you eventually come to a, a price like that. And sometimes there are so many of them out there that if one of them doesn't take you, the other guy will. <laughs> so... But the idea is not to 
cause, you know, just like there was one situation where one devotee was in um, Vrindavan, he was in Loi Bazaar. Loi Bazaar is the place where you, you know, you can buy everything you need for Krishna conscious activities, everything is there. And so um, he got into a fight with one, one merchant and he, he, he hit him. And then he got back to Prabhupada. Prabhupada didn't even want to hear the story, what happened. He said, send that boy back to his country immediately. He hit a bridge of Basi. He probably didn't even want to hear the story. Send him back to his country and they put him on the plane and send him back home. That was a great offense. You know? Now as you speak, Maharaj, this almost happened to me. I, I almost hit a bridge. I mean, I didn't, but but it was it was such a difficult situation. The bridge budget was so annoying. It was in the middle of the night. He was uh, he was uh, uh, shouting at us and uh, and things. And you know, you I almost got into this. Yeah, you you can't. You, know, you just have to ignore that. That's all. It's like if you go to Nandagram, Krishna's birthplace. You know, they immediately come up to you and they demand money. They demand money. We just ignore them, that's all. If you become like them, then you're just <coughs> as bad as them, that's all. Okay. Okay. Dandavats. Sanyasi, no money. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that. <laughs> and it's true, because I don't carry anything. <laughs> But if I need some money, I ask the devotee with me. He, he carries the money. So, sannyasi, piksha. <laughs> yeah. So you you don't want to become like them by getting angry and argue and all that stuff. It's that just becomes offensive. <clears throat> Has a monkey ever stole your shoes? Uh, a fruit. <laughs> fruit, okay. The monkey's always stealing. And then you have to bargain with the monkey. And then the monkey will, you know, you are. If he steals your fruit, you're not going to get that back. But he steals your shoe and he's chewing on it. And that's the end of the shoe. <laughs> Some of them, they're fallen by Vaishnavas in previous lives and they're forced to take birth into the Holy Land again to finish up their time and then go back home after that birth. So, yeah, the monkeys, and even the dogs and the pigs that reside in the Holy Land, these are usually people who are sadhus in previous lives but had committed some abominable activities in the Dham. So they were forced to take a lower birth in the Dham. And then after that birth, they go back to Godhead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for this lecture. It was very interesting. We have uh, quite a lot of sanghas uh, with devotees uh, in Celle and at my home. And you mentioned this book uh, that describes how to properly receive the guest. She wants a copy? Ale želiš kopiju? Yes, please, Hare Krishna. It's in, sitting in Croatia right now. Na Hrvaškom je sedaj. When I go to Croatia, which is, which is in about three weeks, I'll bring it back. Then. Mm -hmm. 
Whatever she said, it sounded really good. <laughs> Here in Slovenia, we have a custom to always um, serve and gift gifts in uneven number. So three, six, nine, never like pair numbers. And G it's giving, interesting that that is you mentioned. Oh, about three, three, six. Yeah, nine. yeah. numbers. Yeah, also have a mm -hmm. effect like mm -hmm. that. There's a whole science of numbers that apply to etiquette also, yeah. There's a whole... Uh, oh. Etiquette means behavior. <laughs> okay, Hare Krishna. Mala. Puna wala. Na lipsha khala. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can I have one short question? Uh, yeah, I guess. I heard, <laughs> I heard that uh, this tr a number of three applies for if you serve prasavadam in the evening. That means that uh, the person is your enemy. But if you serve three in the morning, that means it's a friend. Is that correct? Or no? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's the Slovenian culture. <laughs> no, I heard this from Vedic culture devotees. No, 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 no it's not. No, 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 no. Three is three, <laughs> for like that. But I mean, if you don't know, most devotees don't know. They do it anyway. I get three all the time. Three, <laughs> three, <laughs> So Madhatri, I had to tell her, right? I told you, I instructed her about that one, right? <laughs> she knows. <laughs> yeah, so it happens. It's just, it's such a subtle point that people are not aware of it. But Prabhupada made that point when George Harrison was given three, he said three means enemy. So, if you're an enemy in the morning, enemy in the evening, <laughs> enemy all day. <laughs> Be my little bit enemy and love me all the day. You know that that song. What is that? Sugar in the morning, sugar in the evening, sugar at supper time. Be my little sugar and chant Hare Krishna all the time. <laughs> little change in the words there. That's a, one of these American jingles. Su Devi, uh, Sri Devi has been asking, uh, wanting to ask a question for the last, what was it, one hour? <laughs> okay. Oh, you didn't forget it, did you? Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for your mercy. I I have a question. Yes, you're right. It's been burning in my mind ever since you know this past time and all this happened. Now I'm not asking this in a challenging way, but more as a way to understand what is the right thing to do. Um. You know, before my Krishna conscious life, I lived in India. I was a very young wife and mother. And this principle of etiquette was definitely, you know, what I grew up with. And then when I became, <clears throat> uh, like I said, a wife and mother, uh, offering hospitality was natural, very natural. And then I found that all kinds of people will land up in my house. And they knew, <laughs> here's a lady who's going to, you know, give them something to eat and so on. So all kinds of people would show up. Ladies would come just to sit and gossip. Men would come, and my, now my ex-husband, wouldn't even be home. And they would just come because they knew, uh, I, I just, you know, that was just natural for me to offer something. And then after some time, I found myself getting so frustrated because they will just come to eat and waste my time, basically. And 
I don't know. I was not even Krishna conscious or anything that time. But I, I told, now he's my ex-husband, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. So I don't know whether I did the right thing or wrong thing. I'm just asking, what, what do you do <laughs> when you have people like this who come and just come to your home to just sit and eat and waste your time? Hmm. Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> Just preach to them <laughs> and then they'll leave. <laughs>